Welcome to Game Changers with Molly Fletcher, where we take you behind the scenes with peak performers to learn what makes them tick and discover how you can apply their lessons to your life. I'm your host, Molly Fletcher. What if you treated your home as your most important organization? Frustrated by all the unpaid invisible work she was doing for her family and recognizing that she wasn't alone, Eve Rodsky set out to change society one partnership at a time. Women have long shouldered the brunt of domestic responsibilities, regardless of whether they work outside the home or not. So if you've ever felt burned out by the endless responsibilities or catch yourself saying, I'll do this myself, then listen to this conversation for real solutions. In her best-selling book, Fair Play, Eve applies her Harvard-trained background in organizational management to create a system that helps partners rebalance their domestic workload and reimagine their relationship. Eve's work, backed by Reese Witherspoon's media company, Hello Sunshine, has elevated the cultural conversation around the value of unpaid labor and care. In our conversation today, we explore the hidden costs of doing it all and how to rebalance our home life through boundaries, systems, and communication. This one is so good, and I cannot wait to hear how it helps you. Here's my conversation with Eve Rodsky. All right, so Eve, in your book, Fair Play, you talk about the invisible unpaid labor at home that disproportionately falls on on us, right, On, on women. At what point did you realize that this isn't just a problem in your own home? And that maybe there's something you could do about this. Well, Molly, you get it, right? Because uh, you had kids in in frequent succession. But I think, you know, this all started for me um, from a text my husband Seth sent me. And I talk about this in Fair Play, right? He sent me a text that said, I'm surprised you didn't get blueberries. And who knew that that text would, you know, lead to a movement 10 years later. But uh, you can help me picture the scene because I'm sure you've had a blueberries breakdown of your own <laughs> where oh, yeah. um, I'm getting this request to be the fulfiller of my husband's smoothie needs while I have, you know, a breast pump in a diaper bag on the passenger seat of my car because he sent that text to me right after my second son, Ben, was born. Uh, I have gifts to return for a newborn baby in the back of the car. I have a client contract in my lap, Molly, because I had just been uh, forced out of the traditional workforce. I always say forced out. I don't say we, I quit ever again because we're forced out as mothers. Um, so there was a lot of swirling chaos um, in my life after my second son was born that led me to pull over to the side of the road and start crying over this very innocuous text. But um, it wasn't innocuous to me because what it summed up was that after 10 years of marriage, I had become the default or what I call in fair play, the she fault. This, this applies to all couples, not just heteronormative couples, but but it is a pro, I use the pronoun she and women broadly because this happens to women. And I became the she fault for literally every single household and domestic task for my family, Molly. So this was after, you know, thinking that I was gonna have a fair partnership because I grew up in a single parent household. And I vowed, Molly, I vowed that if I got married, I would do it differently than my mom did, that I wouldn't be somebody who had a shoulder at all. And um, I was falling into the same traps, the same patterns. I have a thousand stories like that, right? Like we're, and, and I love all the examples in your documentary that is fantastic in the book and the card game. I mean, they're just, they're so real for, for so many of us, right? That my favorite one is the one you talk about where the husband, I think it was, said, do they need to eat? Oh, my God. I'll t- right? yes, I mean, so yes, classic, yes. hilarious. Well, <laughs> it's unbelievable. I think that that's a good story because you asked me particularly when did I know this was more than a me problem. Mm. And 
My blueberries breakdown made me more aware of what was happening around me because you have to remember back in 2011, it's hard to remember, but you know, I still had a Blackberry back then, Molly, you know, <laughs> um, we didn't have, I think iPads had just come out. Um, we didn't have TikTok or social media to tell me that the, the, the term second shift, invisible work, unpaid labor, mental load was a thing that, that had been talked about for feminists, from feminists, you know, since pretty much 1960. So I didn't know any of this was happening. I just knew that something bad was happening in my own marriage. And so after that day, I talk about in the book, this breast cancer march I go to in downtown LA. I had just moved to LA and I had nine of my friends with me. Not all of us were married to men, but the ones that were, um, we were having this Saturday morning of a really a fun morning honoring a friend who had been cured and celebrating her and wearing pink and glitter and carrying signs that like said, not just a female problem. And then at noon, we became the reverse of Cinderella. Like literally, Molly, we all turned into pumpkins. I wouldn't have noticed this, but for the blueberries breakdown. So you were asking me when I noticed it was other women. These were nine women I respected so much. And we use our voice in so many contexts, like an Oscar winning producer and uh, a head of stroke and trauma at a major hospital. But what I saw these women doing at noon was responding to texts from their partners, like, when are you coming home from the parade? Like, where's Hudson's soccer bag? If you want me to take him to soccer, you need to let me know where you left the bag. Or what's the address of the birthday party? Did, do you want me to bring a gift? And these powerful women, I see them shrinking into themselves. And then, as you said, my favorite text was my friend Kate's husband, who texted her and we looked over her shoulder, do the kids need to eat lunch? It's unbelievable. So before they left that day, the, my first act of resistance in this movement was, they all left me and said, you know what? We can't go to lunch. We left our partners with too much to do. So that was disappointing in and of itself. But I asked them, I said, look, you know, I, they know I love research and data that they call me Dr. Eve. All I do is like quote statistics all day long. And so I asked them, to help me count up how many phone calls and texts we had received. And we had 30 phone calls and 46 texts for 10 women over 30 minutes, Molly. Insane. And so then you sort of pulled back and said, what would it look like if we treated our homes as our most important organization? Which I think is so cool the way you shifted that and said, what would that look like? And, and that... That was really where you started, right? It, it, what would that look like? Yeah, which I think is so interesting. First of all, again, back in 2011, nothing out there. There was Arlie Hochschild from the 90s talking about the second shift. Even therapists weren't talking about this. In fact, in my own couples therapy, I was completely gaslit when I wanted to bring up that Seth didn't put the garbage liner back in the bags, you know, back in, into, the, into the garbage can. And the therapist was saying, like, we don't talk about that stuff here. Seth's a great father. And I was like, I know he's a great father. I'm not saying that. I'm saying I need more help. I'm overwhelmed. So now, thank God, you know, cut to 10 years later, we have all, we have uh, thousands of therapists trained in the fair play method. So that will never happen again, hopefully. But back then it was such a new topic to talk about solutions. Everybody was just complaining. And so I think, like you said, the most important revelation for me was that I could look at this differently than therapists look at it. Because therapists do look, they look at internal work. They look at, you know, your, your, how you grew up, power lens, which is important. Lots of internal stuff I thought was really great. But the way I look at the world, Molly, as somebody who's a lawyer um, and who definitely did not, in their third grade, what do you want to be when you grow up born? It did not say gender division of labor expert. <laughs> I'll tell you that. It probably said like activist or um, astronaut, but but what I turned into was somebody who could look at this from a different lens. Most people were looking at this from a sociology lens or from a, um, a psychology lens, but I was looking at this as a behavior design lens. And as a lawyer, what I do is I design organizations for people that look like the HBO show Succession. And yes, Molly, you should feel bad for me. But what I do for those organizations is I allow regardless of the behavior change or how people feel or if they're biased against their second son, I leave that again to the therapist. But what I do is I use structured decision-making tools to change people's behaviors. 
And so once I realized I could get my ass in gear and become my own client, Mm -hmm. (laughs) I said, okay, could I use the same systems I've been using for 15 years, you know, at that time, a decade with my clients and start treating the home as our most important organization. So that's what I did. And there was a secret formula. That secret formula is boundaries, systems, and communication. And so slowly, and I I wonder if you can guess sort of what I thought in terms of boundaries for women, systems, or communication, which I thought was the easiest to start with. I mean, what do you think was the easiest of all three? For you to create or to deploy? For me to start with, yeah. To to start with boundaries or systems. Exactly, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's what it was. It was systems because I couldn't work on boundaries at that time because so many women said they didn't believe they deserved a permission to be unavailable from their roles. I couldn't work on communication because women were saying they didn't have the tools to, to ask for what they needed. But I did. I knew I could work on systems. I mean, the, the shit I do list. I mean, so was that sort of the beginning of like, I'm going to just pull back and write down all the shit I do. And that's what became fair play, right? And it's interesting to me, too, because your rule one, right, uh, of fair play is that all time is created equal, which I just love that. And I love that it's fair play. It's not, you know, you you were intentional. You didn't use the word equity or equality. No, no, it's not equal play. Right, nope. right. So get me inside of sort of all time is created equal and, and the shit I do list and how that led you to where you are, right, with all the work you're doing with Reese you know, the documentary, I mean, it's just, it's, it's awesome. Well, thank you, Molly. Um, So the beauty of working on boundary systems and communication, that's what fair play is. It's a practice in all three of those areas. The good news, a lot of people are talking about boundaries these days. So I'm very happy that these conversations are starting to happen. People are now talking about unpaid labor and visible work. I see Google's, you know, Google, when I do a Google search on it, it's coming up a lot more than when Fair Play came out. So I do believe, thank you, Molly, for being a cultural warrior also to help us have these types of conversations. But yes, so Molly, just like any type A Gen X woman, I believed that my system would be as easy as making the invisible visible because Peter Drucker, who is our organizational management consult uh, guru, that all of us who who sort of do a combination of business and law, we love him. He says, you know, what you can't manage, what you can't measure. And so to me, I knew the first step was to literally call up women that look like you and say, Molly, and again, we didn't have TikTok. I couldn't ask this as an Instagram poll. I had to literally (laughs) use Facebook, call people up, ask them in Costco lines till I could get, you know, a sample that looked like the U.S. Census, which my intern helped me, my data science intern helped me put together. But eventually, after nine months, I did get a spreadsheet called the Shit I Do spreadsheet that was 98 tabs long with over 2,000 items of invisible work. And Molly, the great thing about that in 2011 and 2012 doing that work was it was the first time I didn't feel alone. I felt so alone in my own marriage and isolated. I had left my workplace, I told you, because they took away my direct reports and told me I would have to pump in a dark stairwell. So I sort of was abandoned by my partner and my workplace. And it was strangers. It was women who said to me, oh my God, Eve, you know, I received your spreadsheet from the Jewish Federation of Arizona. And I want to let you know that I didn't see Girl Scout cookies ordering in sales on your spreadsheet. And I was like, oh my God, Girl Scout cookies ordering in sales (laughs) under extracurricular non-sports. Eve, you know, you put down two minutes for the application of sunscreen under medical and healthy living. Well, actually, what about the 30 minutes for the chase? Okay, yes, Mm -hmm. 30 minutes for the chase. (laughs) And it was this beautiful, beautiful exercise. But once I sent it to Seth as just a list, and he sent me back a monkey emoji covering its eyes, I don't want to see this, a see no evil emoji. I realized that lists alone don't work, Molly. Women have been making lists for probably hundreds of years. And I knew that's when I knew that it was going to be harder, that it was going to take developing a system, and it's going to, it was going to take the whole secret formula of the boundaries, the systems, and the communication. So I'll just tell you one thing about the systems before we get to all time is created equal. Women underreport what they do, men overreport. So I couldn't develop a system in that context because when I would ask women married to men, and again, I started with that because that's where the problem lies in the heteronormative marriages, 
I would hear, who does groceries? Oh, we both do. Who does meals? We both do. Who picks up the kids? We both do. So I was feeling like, how am I going to break through to actually understand what's really happening in marriages? So the one question that really changed my life because it opened, it broke up in the whole fair play system was how does mustard get in your refrigerator? That was <laughs> sure. it. That, that question, Molly, <laughs> changed my life because I asked it in 17 countries. Everybody knows what a condiment is. And I finally realized and found out that it was women who were noticing that their second son, Johnny, liked yellow mustard with their protein. Otherwise, they would choke. They wouldn't eat it. That the conception phase is a very big deal in our organizational management framework. I was noticing that women were the ones monitoring the mustard for when it went when it ran low. And they were the one getting stakeholder buy-in from their family for what they needed on the grocery list. They didn't call it stakeholder buy-in, but that's what I was listening for. That's planning. And then it was men who were going to the grocery store at the execution phase to pick up the yellow mustard, but they're bringing spicy Dijon home every fucking time. Right. <laughs> right. And then every woman who I was talking to in these 17 countries said, Eve, no, your system will never work with me, for me because I'm not going to hand over ownership of my living will to a man who doesn't even know how to bring home the right type of mustard. <laughs> that was it. And so that was the, when I realized that these small problems were actually not really small, they were an erosion of accountability and trust in our most important organization, Molly, um, because we break up the ownership of the conception and planning, the mental load from the execution of doing things. It was like a light bulb. I said, okay, ownership mindset over these tasks, conception, planning, execution, staying together, that will bring back accountability and trust. That was my thesis. I tested it over a decade and I'm here to tell you it works. Ownership mindset, when you can do an ownership of one task, it doesn't have to be equal. It becomes very, very fair. And for Seth and me, it started with extracurricular sports. He genuinely thought showing up to the Little League field was handling extracurricular sports for my family. Once I said to him, the conception and planning is ordering their equipment or borrowing it. It's being on an 85 person text chain to coordinate two different practices two times a week. Right. <laughs> it is also finding their birth certificates, Xeroxing them, logging them onto some sort of 1985 portal that I can't, that keeps crashing on me. Once he realized that all of a sudden he was taking over six hours of week of work, even though it's just one task in that 100 task, 98 tab spreadsheet that be evolved into a card metaphor. So those 100 cards, which were the tabs, is the metaphor of the fair play game. When Seth just took on the one card, the extracurricular sports card, that was six hours of my week back. And so that is the nerding out way to tell you how I was able to get from an over-reporting situation where I couldn't break through who was doing what in the home to really understanding the system had to be one of ownership because that's what brought back accountability and trust in our most important organization, which was the home. So is this something, so if, if somebody is a, is a stay-at-home parent, this is deployable depending on whether you work in or outside the home. I just wanted to kind of clarify that for everybody. 1,000%. Um, and actually, it's even deployable for neurodivergent people. Um, and I know a lot about neurodivergence. I've been working in the autism space since my brother was diagnosed um, in junior high school. But ADHD neurodivergence really works when things are spelled out. And so for the neurodivergent, not only did I say you have to have ownership, you know, or I suggest ownership over a task as opposed to just executing on a million things for people, because those random assignment of tasks are easier to forget. I call those rats. You don't want your home to be infested by rats. It, it, it works for people who understand that, okay, I can handle this one task from start to finish. It's better for neurodivergent people in many cases. And for single parents, what it does is it shows you the value that you can't do this alone. And so I, what, what single parents tell me, in, including my mother, is that when she saw the card, she started to cry because she said, how was it that I thought this was okay, that I was supposed to handle this all for you and your brother 
and nothing was supposed to fall through the cracks. Of course things fell through the cracks. And so it was the first time in her life that she gave herself a little bit more uh, grace. Do you find yourself feeling like you don't have enough time? Like you're drained and burned out? If so, head over to mollyfletcher.com backslash webinar to access this free training and get my game-changing energy management framework. That's mollyfletcher.com backslash webinar. Start today and learn to have more energy for what matters most. What did you find about how men and women view time differently? So that's the question I wanted to bring up, but I needed to talk to you about systems first because that was my easiest breakthrough. So after that breakthrough of understanding the ownership mindset works, I sat down with my Aunt Marianne, who told me that in her Mahjong group, if you don't bring snack twice, you're out. Mm -hmm. And so then I got really depressed, Molly, because I kept thinking, wow, even the ownership mindset of a task, it's happening in people's Mahjong groups. We know what happens in the workplace, right? I don't go into work for Molly and say, hey, what should I be doing today? I'm just going to wait here and sit here until you tell me what to do. So it was really depressing because the ownership mindset was being deployed even in like Aunt Marion's Mahjong group, but it wasn't being used in the home. And so I knew that systems alone wasn't going to work. And that's when it got depressing because I kept saying, you know, why is this very easy ownership mindset that we use literally everywhere else, including around snack time for Mahjong groups, not being used in the home? And that's when I realized that the boundaries for women had been breached. And that's the conversation why Fair Play, I think, is really triggering for people. It's not a book, oh, yes, this is easy. It's a system. We're all going to deploy it. There's a, there was a lot of pushback when it came on the market because people were pushing back to me that this is my job, especially stay-at-home moms. What are you telling me that my partner should help? They make money. That's their job. Um, there was It was very triggering for me to tell women that they deserve a permission to be unavailable from their roles as partners, parents, and professionals. By professionals, I mean anybody who works for pay or who stays home and works in the home. And the reason I knew it was so triggering was because I would say things to women like, close your eyes and picture the school calling and you're not picking up the phone. You, I will not allow you to pick up the phone. And they were having a stress response even in the in the exercise. Yeah, they were like, their heart started to pound. And so this idea that you are allowed to be unavailable from these things, that your time, you deserve time choice over how you use your day, it became really triggering. And that's why this idea of rule one for fair play, this idea that you have to buy in, we have to all buy in, that all time is created equal, that men's time is not diamonds, it's not to be guarded, Whereas our time as women is not sand, it's not infinite. But so many women were treating their time that way, Molly. And so how do you convince, so let's just say a, a husband and a wife, how do you convince a man, if you will, in that circumstance, that time is equal and that you can, you know, turn your phone off when you, I mean, I travel, uh, you know, 100 plus days a year and I keep my phone on it by my bad side table still. Because as much as, I mean, my husband's amazing, but the phone's not there, right? So how do you get them to buy in and execute against keeping their phone on so that you can step back in a way? Well, that's the hardest part, right? These initial conversations. So first, what I'd say is this is a 101, right? I mean, I'm Seth and I have only now equal cards, and this has taken us, you know, 12 years, right, Molly? So this is a 101. I think starting really small is very important. But what the way that, let's see, actually, I've never done this before um, on a podcast, but I'll pull up this text or this LinkedIn message that this wonderful young husband sent to me from Korea. Okay, here we go. He says, thank you, message from Korea. Dear Ms. Rodsky, I read your book, Fair Play Project, that's what it's called in Korea, and write this message to express gratitude for you. I bought this book as one of husbands in the world, and I confess I thought I'm a fairly good husband, but I was wrong. It's not there to shame men. I will tell you that. It's become a love letter to men, right. but I just thought it was funny right. the way he said it. I strongly believe everybody must read this book before they get married or have a baby because, 
Here's the because for men. Personally, I lost my sister, who was a high court judge and a mother of two elementary student sons four years ago. It was because cerebral hemorrhage stroke took her. I believe this disease exploded as she worked too hard and handled too much things during her father-in-law's death, which was just a week before her death. She took care of too many things as a full-time worker and a perfectionist judge. I think if this Fair Play project was spread all over the whole of Korea and every husband executes this project, my sister is still with us, having a balanced life she deserved with her smiling face, which I terribly, terribly miss. Mm. Wow. This is not optional. It's about um, your partner's health. It's about their mental health, their physical health, your relational health. And so for people who say, we had a deal, you know, I'm stressed out, I'm supposed to handle everything else, and my partner takes care of everything in the home, it doesn't work, Molly. It just doesn't work. The only time it works, and I know this because I've spoken to many, many, many religious communities, is if it's indoctrinated through religion. And even then, when I talk to people who are sitting in those religions, they feel the resentment and and the unfairness underneath. Because many religions, like I come from a very black hat Jewish tradition where men are afforded diamond time and women have to do everything. And it's supposedly God's duty. I talked to a lot of um, people in the Mormon church who said that their church called them the women helpers and men priests. So I would say, um, you know, these are very serious topics because, you know, systems and countries and cultures and religions have been designed around subjugating women's time. And so it's a very triggering. These conversations are very triggering. I wish I could have just put a card game out in the world, Molly, but right. <laughs> it ha- we have to be talking about some of these bigger issues that really hit us. And that that was the hardest part for me. I, the, the, really the only time I cried in fair play, besides in my frustration with Seth, like the blueberries breakdown, was when I understood just how rigged the time game was against women. When I realized that I saw um, curriculums for our health classes that said breastfeeding was free, when it's really an 1800 hour a year job. I saw gaslighting in that occupational segregation happens when women enter male professions, salaries automatically come down. But the saddest part, the thing that made me cry was all the women out there that started to believe that their time was less valuable. And the four things they said, the most popular four things they said to diminish their own and devalue their own time were one, my partner makes more money than me, so I have to do more in the home. Two was, I'm a better multitasker. I'm better at wiping asses and doing dishes. Um, And I take pride in that. That was mine. I really thought there was a lot of pride in that. Or in the time it takes me to tell him or they what to do, I should do it myself. That's another big one. But the the, the hardest one for me was, yes, we're both colorectal surgeons, but my partner is better at focusing on one task at a time and I can find the time. Because we can't find time, Molly. You know, we're not Albert Einstein. We can't mess with the space-time continuum. So that's where I had to say, look, we have to stop this. We have to stop being complicit in our own oppression, and we have to start asserting that our time is valuable. How do you tell women, and I'm sure you've coached people on this, to start engaging and shifting the home and shifting the dynamic and shifting the time, et cetera? Where do you tell them to start? Well, it's so hard. There's a a couple of entry points. One of them, I'd say, is you're sort of leading me, not on purpose, but you're a great interviewer. You sort of got me to my last piece of the secret formula. So we started with systems, obviously, that was the mustard. We went into boundaries, which is the all time is created equal, which is the hardest part. But actually it starts with communication. And what I'm here to tell you is that if you feel like these are two triggering of conversations, you just have to think about this one woman who said to me, I can't talk about domestic life. My partner will never go for this. It's too triggering. We've had that conversation before, it didn't work. So this one woman early on in my interview said that to me. And Molly, that's what I believe people, that they actually didn't communicate about domestic life. So I actually wrote down, doesn't communicate about domestic life. Well, 20 minutes later, giving me examples of what was happening in her life, 
she tells me about the fact that she's now dumping wet clothes on her husband's pillow when he forgets to take them out of the dryer. So I crossed out, doesn't communicate about domestic life, and I put in all caps, communicating a domestic life. So I think that's where we start, that you're already communicating about domestic life. You may have had this conversation once, but that's like me saying I ran once in 2005 and I'm supposed to be fit forever. Once we realize this is a communication practice, first and foremost, about asking for what we need, that's when the whole trifecta of the secret formula comes into play. And I love how you talk about it too, because not keeping score, right? Like, I love that. And I am grateful that I'm in a marriage like that, right? Where there is no scorekeeping. There never has been. And, and, and I'm just grateful for that. But, but that, you know, not keeping score towards real collaboration, real partnership. How do you get people to make that shift, right? Because I have friends where there's a lot of scorekeeping, right? And I'm like, yikes, this is not healthy. Well, I think that's why the cards can come out first. So fair play is a metaphor. And there are actual cards that you could purchase to um, play the game. But it's I awesome. bought them, girl. Yes, exactly. So they're really fun. They're a great tool. However, if you don't read the book, if you don't understand this is a practice of boundary systems and communication, then the cards will become a scorekeeping tool. I'm holding all the cards. You're a loser. You hold none of the cards. I can't live like this. So that's why I did not release the cards first. It, I, I actually released the book a year and a half before we released the card tool because I needed to be on podcasts like Molly's. I needed to talk to women who could help me unpack the bigger issues around how you move from lists and scorekeeping to true partnership. And so what I will say about that is back to the communication piece. There was this one woman who said to me, I reached out to her during the pandemic because she had started a, or she was part of a forum in England called um, The Reasons That I Hate My Partner and Kids During COVID. And there were 27,000 members in this Facebook group. Oh. <laughs> so I was fascinated by it because everybody, anything related to unpaid labor, people sent to me. So of course, my friend sent it to me from the UK and said, you have to check this out. So one woman says in a post in this group that if her husband dies during COVID, it won't be from the disease. It's going to be because of her. So I reached out to her and I said, well, tell me how you communicate about domestic life. And again, she says to me, I don't. It's too triggering. I'm holding on to everything. And so I just want us to just contemplate this for a minute. So instead of looking at this as a shift in communication, I'm not asking for a start. I'm just asking you how to shift communication. This person is communicating. But she feels more safe publicly threatening to murder her partner in front of 27,000 strangers than talking to her partner. And I think that's how so many of us feel. And so what I say is, where do you start? You're asking the, about these shifts. We have to begin a practice of, of communication. And so what I say here today there's a lot of unlearning you're hearing about. It's a lot of triggering conversations. But what you can do before you even start fair play, before you look at the cards, before you read the book, before you watch a documentary, you can start sitting down with your partner every day for 10 minutes and just start checking in. When emotion is low and your cognition is high, we don't do it, Molly. We don't do it. I asked a thousand people on social media. I did a poll. What's your most important practice? I got meditation. I got people confused by the question. I got exercise. Not one of the thousand said communication. Communication is our most important practice. I'm here to tell you that. And you talk about that too. Your work, you know, communication can't, in both of our work, we can't do it without healthy communication. Yeah, no question. And I mean, gosh, I mean, you think about just at the beginning of the day with a cup of coffee, starting with, hey, here's what's going on with the girls today. Here's where you could help me. Here's what I could do. Pull out the card, all that. Yeah, I mean, yep, just... exactly. Like we did that tonight. Like, I mean, this morning, actually, because we're going to a Lakers game because we're hoping LeBron will break the all time scoring record. And so Seth and I, because it's a little it's different, you know, typically Zach has um, basketball practice and there's a tutor. So 
we're always checking in. But if we hadn't checked in this morning, there would have actually have been a miscommunication because Seth thought he was meeting us on La Brea after a meeting because he thought the game was at 7.30. And I was like, oh no, actually it's now a nationally televised game. So the game's at seven. So he had to cancel his meeting to come with us. Now we're all meeting at the house. Like it would have been chaos, literally chaos. If we hadn't had checked in, he would have still thought the game was late. I'd be like, where are you? We would have been late. We'd be stressed. So that extra five minutes this morning is saving us, oh my God, a whole load of hell at the end of the day. <laughs> How is Seth with all of this, right? Like, I mean, I'm like trying to envision the dude that's married to you that's deploying all the, like, what's that like? Oh my God. Well, it's so funny because we went to dinner with friends who were earlier on their fair play journey, but the husband's really it was intrigued by this process um, and he said to Seth, like, how did you move to such a different dynamic, you know, of more fairness? And Seth said, well, it's easy. You just have to have your wife write a book about you and betray you in a terrible light. <laughs> <laughs> so he deals with it with humor. I'll just say that. A lot of humor. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. That's awesome. You know, you mentioned the pandemic and COVID. I mean, we know the data around this on, on, on what it's done for women. And it certainly shined a light on the things that happen in a home to make it run, if you will. How do you think that, that COVID at, at some level will ultimately affect the way men and women view domestic work? Because it was so bubbled up to the surface and then women took such a hit in the workforce that we've seen, the data's staggering. Um, the good news is I don't think our generation can ever unsee it again, Molly. You know, like, I don't think you and I would be having this conversation um, a decade ago. You know, maybe you would, because, you know, you're an early, you're like a, you know, leader. But in fact, what I will say, Procter & Gamble, because in, in India, this is a really big problem, right? Women are doing trillions of dollars of unpaid labor all over the world. But but in India, it's a big population. It's And so they had started a share the load campaign about men doing laundry. So Procter & Gamble actually brought me to Davos in 2019, where I sat in front of world leaders and said, we are one crisis away from losing 30 years of labor force participation. You don't believe me, but women are that burned out. And I meant, the individual burnout I was seeing on behalf of women, not a global pandemic. But I will say that so many men had said to me, what do you have to complain about? Women are graduating from college more. You're, you're, you're in equal classes and NBAs. So those leaders that were fighting with me about the correlation between burnout of women and labor force participation, now that I have the stats to show that we lost 3.8 million in a flash, now they're back because schools are open. They, they can no longer argue that with me. And so the good news is that while there's all these amazing fair play therapists out in the world now, I can elevate the conversation, Molly, to the policy level. And that's sort of where I'm playing these days. I'm playing in trying to get unpaid labor into the U.S. GDP. I'm playing in, you know, passing federal paid leave. I'm playing in universal child care. So Having so many people take on the individual conversations has now freed me up to um, elevate to the policy level. Was there anything in your research and sort of all of this journey that just blew your mind that was super surprising or maybe it totally reinforced something that, that you had been assuming but was surprised by? Oh, my God. I have something now after 10 years that's blow it, blowing oh, my yeah. mind. Oh, yeah. Talk to me. So... Um, the beauty of doing this for so long is, and having, thanks, shout out to my amazing interns who, and helpers who've helped me along the way with the research, because I had the names of 200 women that were, you know, on Excel, another Excel sheet in 2011 that I had started to interview for Fair Play that at the time, there was not a card game. It was just the spreadsheet, the shit I do spreadsheet. They had identified that they were the ones in charge of 67 out of the 98 tabs, like the medical and healthy living, like the, you know, gifts, right. you know, oh, teacher's yeah, gifts, sure. all those. Totally. If a woman had identified as holding or in charge of the 67 or more tabs at the time, 
and also reported that they worked full time for pay. I've been able to find those women in the past 10 years, every one of them actually, it's not that long ago and I, none of them have ghosted me. They've all reported back. Every one of those women is being treated for a stress-related illness, Molly. Wow, 100%. Yeah, that blows my mind. 100%. Not 99%, not 90%, 100%. And what I mean by that is hair loss, insomnia, SSRI use, thyroid issues, cancer diagnoses. There were a couple being treated for stress-related illnesses, not by a doctor, but self-treating. So I also included those. That's why I got to the full 200. And that was uh, self-medicating either through edibles. I asked, you know, do you take any other substances to sort of get you through your day? So it was benzos, which are Valium, Ativan, edibles on the weekends uh, to, to numb themselves through their, their days um, and or more than two glasses of wine a night. That was the most shocking thing to me. And that's where I'm really playing also for fair play that back to, to my friend in Korea who said his sister's head exploded with a cerebral brain hemorrhage. It may not be that dramatic, but these slow death by a thousand cuts is really affecting women's health. And so now I'm trying to play in the health space because I actually think what I've seen is lawmakers care more about the health space than they do about women's labor force participation because it's a cost to society. Even though labor force participation for women is a cost for society, they don't see it that way. They see women in a home as a benefit, um, especially if it's white women. So it's very complicated. But you, you can't ignore these health issues. No, I mean, you can't at all. And, and have you ever been able to discern, like when we think about the, the word burnout, which is just coming, it, it's rampant right now. And we think about women burnout, which is often associated with work, right? Their careers. But yet I'm almost hearing you say that the cause of it is being impacted for sure by the, by the workload at home. Have you ever been able to delineate at some level what percentage of the cause of burnout is coming from home or their work? It's a great question. I'm trying to do that for my my third book, which I'm moving into now, which is hope, tentatively titled Lead Fair, is really to understand how much unpromotable, uh, unpaid labor women are doing in the workplace. And then I, I will be able to hopefully quantify it uh, a little bit better to say women are holding two thirds or more in the home and two thirds or more in the workplace. And I can start asking them, which is more stressful. So no, I haven't been able to do that yet, but I do know that those two things, they're not causations for each other, but they're definitely correlations because that demographic is holding too much. It's they're holding too much. The expectations of full-time uh, work and holding most of the unpaid labor in the home is just too much uh, to thrive. And so to me, that is the, the crux of burnout. And we've only dealt with burnout as a workplace issue, like you said, but we've never dealt with it as a relational health issue. How do you relate with other people in your world to help you with these unpaid tasks? And that's really what I'm trying to do is say this is a relate, uh, burnout is a relational health issue. So unicorn space, what is unicorn space and what is it not, right? Like I, the way you define it to me is really interesting, right? And, and finding your unicorn space which is sort of a bit of an antidote to burnout, right? So Molly, I want to come back to do a whole other episode on unicorn space with you. So let's make sure that we do that. But I do want to say something that I can end with that brings us in. You asked me about entry points to the conversation. The idea of a unicorn space, which people are like, what the heck are you talking about? Is an entry point into the fair play conversation. Meaning, I wish I could tell you the antidote to burnout was a walk around the block, faking your commute, having a drink with a friend, going a yearly girls trip or women's trip or whatever you want to call it. Um, but no, the only antidote to burnout that we have is recognizing that we need to be consistently interested in our own lives. That's a harder sell than telling you to go buy hair dye or go get a manicure. <laughs> right. A unicorn space recognizes that we need basic self-care, like exercise. We need things like friendships. But what we really need is activities that make us come alive, that stoke three things that I talk about, which are curiosity, 
connection, meaning you have to share with the world, and completion. So Molly, I will say this is a unicorn space for you because I got to listen to some of your episodes. You're curious. I wonder X, right? And then you're like, who do I connect with to explore that curiosity? You have connection. And then not only do you connect with that person, you share it with the world because you complete an episode. Even if you don't like the way you sound, you edit it and you put it up in the world. And that those three things are hard. They are hard. It's why it's not just a one-off spin class because it's hard to have wonder. It's, and so what I will end with is that if you're thinking, I can't have a fair play conversation, what I want you to start thinking about first is how can I have a conversation with myself where my homework assignment to you out there is I need just one day a week where you say the most important thing you'll do that day is outside of your roles as a parent, a partner, and professional. One day a month, we'll start, with, we'll start even smaller. One day a month, you can DM me or Molly. The most important thing you did that day is not something you did in service of being a parent or a partner or a professional. That's what I want to leave that gift with people. Here are a few of my favorite takeaways from our conversation. Number one, all time is created equal. How cool is this? All time is created equal. Fair play is about how both of you reframe how you value time and then commit to the goal of rebalancing the hours that domestic work requires between each other. But the first step is you have to believe your time should be measured and valued equally. A lot of times that requires changing your mental script. It requires maybe some tough conversation. It requires alignment. Number two, have a tough conversation. When I'm facing a tough choice, I often ask myself this question. What's at risk if I make a change? And what's at risk if I don't make a change? If you're tempted to avoid having this tough conversation in your relationship, consider the cost to your sense of identity, to your career, the cost to your physical and mental health, and the cost to your relationships. Are those things you are willing to compromise? What's so important to you that failure isn't an option? And maybe having a tough conversation is the thing that will pull you through to an outcome that you want most. Number three, give yourself permission to be unavailable. (laughs) Man, I wish I knew this as an agent. Look, I get it. This one is a lot to unpack for a lot of us. But if you enjoy this conversation, be sure to also check out Eve's follow-up book, Unicorn Space. It's all about carving out time and space you need to tap into your most creative self. And that involves giving yourself permission to be unavailable and drop the guilt and the shame. Thanks, as always, for listening to Game Changers with Molly Fletcher. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts. There, you can listen to previous episodes and leave us a review, which helps other people find out about the show. This episode was edited and sound designed by the team at Sound On Studios. You can find out more about their work at soundonsoundoff.com. Check it out. For more about me, visit mollyfletcher.com. Until next time, stay curious and be bold.